So it's been, um, by the way, isn't it great to reflect on his grace still being amazing? Is his grace still amazing to you? Um, yeah, I mean, grace by the very nature is something that's undeserved, unmerited. We don't buy it. We don't work for it. We did nothing to get it. Uh, God came to us when we were not just spiritually sick, not just comatose, but we were spiritually dead. Dead. D-E-A-D, dead, and he came to us. So yes, his amazing, his grace is still amazing, and thank you for reminding us of that this morning. It's been six weeks since we've been in Romans, actually seven weeks if, uh, if you count this week. Since we've been in Romans, I apologize for the long break, and I want to uh, once again express my, my thanks for the way that you, church, have uh, ministered to my family and me during this time uh, of grieving. But I tell you, um, I'm going off script here as well, but, um, you know, I miss my dad, but I asked my mom the other day, I said, Mama, do you, do you go, you know, do you go long stretches without thinking about daddy. And, and her response to me was somewhat surprising. She said, yeah. She said, I don't, I don't really think about him all the time. I, you know, if I'm in a certain place, I might be thinking about him. And I just said, you know, I'm exactly the same way. In fact, I'm, you know, I have moments, but I find myself more than anything being grateful, being thankful, being joyful, right? I mean, uh, and because if... If what I stand up here and preach, or every other pastor that stands up and preaches week in and week out about God's sovereignty and His goodness and what life is all about, and if there really is an afterlife, which there is, if there really is heaven and hell, which there are, and if you know your loved one was safe and secure in Christ, which my dad was, uh, then why would I be grieving so much? Right? I mean, so, and why would you be grieving too much? So be very, you know, thankful that if your loved one was in Christ, where they are right now. Y'all, I mean, we can go through the motions of coming to worship and all that kind of stuff, but that's really where the rubber hits the road. Right? I mean, it, it really is. This is why we come and we worship together. We're worshiping and singing praise and from our hearts because what God has done for us. Okay, I'm going way off script. I know that. Well, I want to just kind of set the context of, of where we are in Romans just to get us back in line, and, and then we can start digging deep uh, for the next several months. Um, and we're going to finish up chapter 6 today. But just to kind of set the, the, the context of where we are, if you remember, chapters 1, 2, and 3 in Romans, Paul is convincingly making the case for the universal need of God's righteousness. He's showing that all of us are guilty. He shows that, that Jews who have the Mosaic law, they can't keep the law, they're guilty. That Gentiles have God's natural law, they can't keep God's natural law, we're guilty. We're all guilty before a holy God. There is none righteous, no, not one, Paul would say in chapter 3, verse 10. He goes on, he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we talked about, if you remember, the, the law, God's, God's law being like a thermometer. And what do we do with a thermometer? We take the thermometer, we put it in our children's mouth, and we determine how sick they are. But we don't understand that my kid's sick. They got it, you know, they're really, really sick. Go get the thermometer, put it in their mouth, and that heals them. No, that does, that's not what happens at all. The law is like the thermometer. It reveals how sick we really are, and it drives us to the doctor. It drives us to the feet of Jesus. So that's what happens in the first three chapters. And then second, Paul reveals in chapter, the end of chapter 3 and then all of chapter 4, the righteousness of God, it's a righteous state of being that God has and it is received by faith. So we need this righteousness. God gives us this righteousness when we receive it by faith. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit uh, more. But then beginning in chapters 5 and going all the way through chapter 8, Paul unpacks the blessings that are associated with this righteous standing before God. For instance, in chapter 5, he, he was talking and he said, you know what, um, if, if we were enemies of God when Christ saved us, how much more, now that we're friends of God, will he save us from God's wrath to come? 
So that's just one of the benefits. And then last time we were together in talking about Romans, we talked about the implications of our union with Christ, right? We, we oftentimes talk about God living within me and, and you know, receiving Jesus into my heart or whatever. But the Bible is much more explicit about not so much Him being in us, which He is, but us being in Christ. In chapter, chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism unto death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So the Bible is saying here that we died with Christ at baptism. Now, baptism here is, I believe, is a shorthand for conversion, right? So when we are baptized, we're not saved then. We're showing to the world that, that what God has done in our lives. But Paul is using that, I think, again, shorthand for conversion. So when we are converted, we are placed into Christ. We are dead to sin, and we have risen to new life with Christ. And we talked about the already and not yet aspects of the kingdom of God. We'll talk about that uh, in a few weeks as well. But then, so we hear all of these things, and if you remember me talking about it, all this good stuff that, that God has done for us in chapters 1 through 6, those are all, uh, the, verb t- the verbs are always in the indicative mood, right? It's not, here's a bunch of stuff you, be, you need to be doing for God. It's like, here's what God has done for you. This is the truth. God has done this for you. And only after that, only after we absorb this and understand this is what God did. He came to me first. I didn't go running, crying after God as as a needy person. He came to me. And then once he's come to me, then and only then does Paul and the other gospel writers break out the imperatives. Only then does he break out the commands. Right? Right? He says, this is who you are positionally in Christ. And because this is who, um, who you are in Christ, then in verse 12, he says, therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. We said then, that's the first imperative. That's the first command that we see in the entire book of Romans. But then it just sounds so too good to be true. So in verse 14 of chapter 6, he gets back to the indicative. He slips in a couple of verses of imperatives, commands, but he gets back to the indicative and it says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you, listen, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have its grips, its talons, its hold on you. Why? Why? Because you're no longer under the law, you're under grace. Now, some might argue that hypothetically there could be two ways to heaven. Now, hang on with me just for a moment. But some could hypothetically argue that. One is to be absolutely perfect in obedience to the law. That if if a person were to live under law and perfectly obey all the law, that means no no lustful thoughts. No cheating, no disobedience, no laziness, no goofing off at work, no borrowing someone else's subscription to watch Netflix, if you want to get down to it, no going 56 miles an hour in a 55 miles per hour zone. I mean, we just lost everybody right then, right? So, so... Perfectly keeping the law. You cannot do any of those things. But not only, it's not just the negative part of the law, but it's the positive part as well. It would mean something like always being kind. Always thinking the very best of others. Always being honorable. In that sense, I suppose such a person, if that such a person existed, would go to heaven. But that's already impossible, right? Because we've already seen that we're all born in this state of sin. It's not just that we do sinful stuff. We're born in this state of being called sin. We've inherited this sinful state, as we talked about, from our father Adam. Adam. 
And so we sin by nature. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's just who we are. So that's what it means to be under the law, perfectly keeping the law. You stand before God at the, at the end of history and you stand and you're judged and he were to ask you this question. This is a question I think is worth always thinking about. He were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Right now, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just throwing that out to everybody here. Most of you come to church all the time. You ought to all know the answer. Some of you probably don't know. You ever thought about it? You die today and you stand before a holy God? I mean, after about a thousand years because you're flat on your face because of His holiness until He lets you get up. And then finally you get up and He looks at you and just says, Hey, uh, this is heaven. You know, why should I let you in? Have you ever thought about that? And most often, if your answer begins with I, you're probably headed down the wrong street. But then if we aren't able to get into heaven because of my righteousness, because if I were to stand before God and say, well, I've been a little bit better than, you know, than, you know I've been 51% good and 49% bad, that just doesn't wash it with God, right? I mean, just like one iota of bad is enough to send us separated from God forever. Why? Because God is totally pure and holy and doesn't allow any sin into heaven. So then what is our standing is either under Law or under grace? Being under grace means that His righteousness, this righteous standing that God owns, is imputed to us. It does not mean that it makes me righteous. It's not infused into me and somehow bubbles up. Now I'm this righteous kind of person. No, it means legally, forensically, God looks at me, God looks at you, and declares you to be righteous. That's what it means to be under grace. Does that almost sound too good to be true? I'm telling you, if it doesn't, church, if it doesn't sound almost too good to be true, I'm not sure that you really do or we really do comprehend that grace really is amazing. It is amazing. It's not just good, it's amazing. Well, this being under grace and not law, it begs a question. And Paul goes, okay, I know you're going to ask this question, so I want to go ahead and answer it. It's very similar. Look in, look in chapter 6, verse 1. I, I invite you to have your Bibles open to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1 says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And he goes on and he gives a bunch of answers. He answers that question all the way down through verse 14. He says, absolutely not. But now in verse 15, he asks a similar question. Look at what he asks. Verse 15, he says this, What then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? I mean, it just sounds so good to be true. It just seems better than anything you could ever imagine that we're not under the law anymore and God's not going to judge me on how well I did or did not keep His law. That I'm in heaven because I've believed in Christ. And so Paul then ask that question, shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? And he says, well, certainly not. Absolutely not. So in the following eight verses, Paul counters this sinning with impunity kind of attitude and says you can't do it. So we're just going to walk our way down through these verses here. There, If you're the kind of person that keeps notes and you go like, this, this sermon has four points, whatever, and I just couldn't come up with points. It doesn't even have any points. It's just a series of logical arguments one after another. So look in verse, verses 16 through 18. Uh, Paul says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves... You are slaves of the one whom you obey. Let me just stop right there for a moment and comment on that Greek word slave. In the, in the New Testament, the Greek word is translated in English sometimes as servant, sometimes as bondservant, sometimes as slave. It depends on the context. Too often times we associate the word slave with the horrible uh, the slavery, the, the chattel slavery that experienced here, we experienced here, or that our forefathers and uh, 
people of this nation experienced years ago. Um, some of that existed in, in these times. And here, um, the people who have translated this, and I think cor- correctly so, translate the word doulos, not as bondservant, but as slave. In other words, he's making the point that you've given up all of your rights. You have no rights. He says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, I want to just stop right there. Zero in on that verse. Don't you know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. And let me ask you this. Sitting out there in this congregation right now, or just if you've read this in the past, or you read it this morning because you knew this is where we would be, and you, or you hear this verse preached or spoken or read, are you going, man, I still sin. I, I still wrestle with sin. I still struggle with sin. So therefore, I mean, it must be very obvious that, that I presented myself as obedient to sin because I'm, I'm still sinning. And, and, and that speaking of me is going to lead to death. I, I'm not obedient to righteousness like I should be. I, I'm obedient to sin at times. And so it's speaking of me there. And so I conclude that maybe I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm obedient to sin. I'm enslaved to unrighteousness. Do, do you ever think like that? Or does that hit you like, man, what, where's the good news here? Well, let's press on to verse 17. That's what Paul says. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. That's true of you. This verse is true of you if you are a believer in Christ. You once were, look at verse 17 again. It says, but thanks be to God that you, this, if you're a believer, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about all of that stuff that we spent a, a little while on in, in chapter 3. Listen to what he says again in chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. And this is the message he's saying. If you've obeyed this, if you've believed this message in your heart, listen to what he says but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it listen the righteousness of God this is a state of being that God owns through faith in Jesus Christ for who for all who will believe for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Here, Paul, again, in verse 17 now of chapter 6, he's saying, Praise God, you used to be enslaved to sin, but you have believed something, and whatever it is you've believed, it has set you free. What is it we believe? Well, Paul has just shown us how God provides a righteousness. Again, a state of being. That when we believe by faith, God imputes that. He reckons that to our account. Yes, we know Jesus went to a cross and he died on a cross for sins. And whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Absolutely true. I mean, that's good news. And we believe in this Jesus. We believe in his work and we believe in his person. What did he do? He redeemed us. He paid a cost. His blood. And by the way, not just a scratch. Someone, someone was telling me, I mentioned, you know, if Jesus had just come and just scratched his hand and a little blood had dripped, that, that, that would have sufficed. No, it would not have sufficed. 
to the Hebrew mind, to the Jewish mind, the life was in the blood. So when we talk about precious is the blood, oh, precious is the flow, that washes me white as snow. It's not just symbolically blood. I mean, it's the life. It's the life that he gave. He redeemed us. He propitiated. We talk about that, that big word. He, he satisfied God's wrath over our sin. Therefore, the Bible says he can be just and the justifier. He deals with sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, the perfect son of God, the only perfect human who kept all of God's rules and laws came and died on the cross. When it should have been me, it should have been you. He died. God dealt with sin there, so he is just, but he's also the justifier. He's the one who he legally declares us as being righteous. And then we talked about faith. What is faith? We said that, that technically it's not our faith that saves us. Understand that, okay? It's not my faith in itself that saves you or your faith that saves you. Your faith is a gift of God, and it is the instrument by which God takes the person and the work of Jesus Christ and gets it into us. It is the instrument, is the faith that, to believe. And God takes His righteousness and credits it to our account. That is the doctrine. This is true for every believer. There are no ranks in the body of Christ. Look in verse 18. Well, let's pick it up. I want to read verse 17 and 18 again. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Listen to verse 18. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Um, I don't even like that translation, have become slaves of righteousness. I think it's better translated, were enslaved to righteousness. You were enslaved. You and I, when we were converted, we were set free from the tyranny, from the, the former slaveholder. Sin no longer, listen, sin no longer has control of you. You say, but I, I sin. I, I understand that. We do sin. We'll talk about that for the next couple of weeks. Paul, thankfully, gives us chapter 7. But understand this. You were enslaved to a malevolent dictator who hates God, and that is sin. And when you were converted, you are no longer enslaved to that malevolent dictator. God makes you enslaved to Him, to obedience, to righteousness. Do you understand that? Man, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't read you today. I can't read you today. I'm just telling you, man, I know we're Baptist. I know we don't stand up and shout and roll around on the floor and all that kind of hodgepodge junk. I know that. But I'm telling you, when you understand that God and God alone enslaved you to himself, to his obedience, to his righteousness, and removed you from Adam's line, he remo removed you from the, the power of sin and the grave and hell, and God imparted the righteousness of His Son to us, not because there's anything lovely in you or me or how we're able to live our lives and, and, and keep doing right or whatever. No, God came to us and God gave us these things. He changed us. And we realize that it ought to make even a Baptist say, Amen. No, oh, it's too late. <laughs> Do you understand? When He says you were enslaved, you were enslaved to righteousness. Again, we go back to that indicative and the imperative. Remember, indicative is just telling how things are. It indicates how things are. Imperative is a command. This is not a command. How many people ever say, you know, I want to be a slave? You know, take me. That's not what he's talking about here at all. God enslaves us. And please understand, this is not sinless perfection. It doesn't mean that when we're converted, we'll never sin again, right? If, if that's the case, I know I wasn't converted. That's not what it's talking about at all. We were set free. Listen, we were set free from the penalty of our sin. And now we are being set free continually from the power of sin. One day, one day, we'll all be delivered from the very presence of sin. 
So that's when we talk about those fancy words, justification, right? You've, we've talked about justification. The fact that the God declares someone righteousness, that's when God pardons us from our sins penalty, which is hell and wrath of God and all those kind of things. And just to go a little fancy on you, Matt, just for a second, uh, we look at justification as being monergistic. What do you mean by that? One work. One person does the work. God does that work. You didn't bring anything to that equation. You didn't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm feeling kind of bad today. I think I need to get saved. I need to change my life. I need to turn over a new leaf. Listen, you're dead. You can't turn over a new leaf. You're lost and hopeless in your sin. You can't do anything. You're at the bottom of a lake, dead. You're a corpse. And God, for whatever reason that we will never really completely understand other than it's anchored in His love, said, that is my child. That one is mine. And He came to you. And He pulled you up out of that lake or that river or wherever it was you were dead. And He breathed into you spiritual life. He made you alive in Christ. Yes, you, you repented. You surrendered to Jesus, but you would never have done that if He would not given you spiritual life. You did not have it in you. That's why the gospel is so good news. You see, the gospel just becomes news. It just becomes ho-hum when we think that I have something to do with that. When we fully understand the implications of God's saving grace, man, how it should change our lives. Well, and so really what we're talking about now in this section, it, it, let's, let's go into verse number 19. Somebody tell me what time. Oh, I got a clock right here. I thought they left it because we put this back up here because I'll tell you why we put this back up here if some of you want to know. Uh, it's not, I didn't have anything against that other little thing, but I, I happened, I walked into my mother-in-law's room one night and she happened to have the, tele, the, the TV on and it was me preaching. And I was like, I'm on TV. What is this all about? And so I sat there and watched myself for a minute behind that podium. And I, and I continued to like move my legs around. It was so distracting to me. I'm sorry for y'all that sit over there. you know, But it was so distracting to me that I just said, oh, we got to cover that up. So that's why this is back here. Nothing, nothing against the other one or this is like super sacred desk. Not, not at all. Uh, but I, the point I was making is they transferred the clock. And it, I've got it. It's upside down, but I've got it. I, I don't. Man, I don't. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. As Wayne Brooks, by the way, said, keep on preaching as long as you want to. <laughs> Verse 19. Paul's going, okay, um, look, y'all, I, I need to, he didn't say it this way, but I'm going to dumb this down just for you a little bit. That's kind of what he's saying. He says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. He says, I'm going to give you an illustration so you can grasp it. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now, listen, now, circle that word now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. What has he just done? 16, 17, and 18 are all indicative. Do you get that? Yes, somebody say, please, yes, I get it. Yes, I get it. 16, 17, and 18. This is what God did for you. He removed you from that malevolent, tyrannical dictator sin and disobedience. He did that. And he enslaved you to righteousness. That's what God is doing. God did that. Okay, that's indicative. Now, when we know that God does that, now we go, okay, now present your members as slaves to righteousness. Leading to sanctification. Do you get it? Paul, Paul is, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like he's saying, before you were converted, and I know you didn't do this, but he's just kind of like saying, this. You, you woke up every morning and you would say something like, you knelt before, you know, sin's altar. And you would say, here's my tongue. Use this in ways that are unholy today. Here are my eyes. Let me look on things today and lust Here's my mind. Use it to undermine others and covet what they have. Here's my heart. Let it be glad for me and my interests alone. I know it didn't happen exactly that way, but that's in effect what Paul is saying. And when we were grasped enslaved to sin, we did nothing good. 
I mean, we could do some good things, but it was never for the right motivations. But now, listen, as Christians, we are free not to sin. As unbelievers, you're not free not to sin. But as Christians, we are free not to sin. We are enslaved to righteousness. That is a paradigm shift. I'm, I know it doesn't make a lot of sense it, it, and right now, maybe. Meditate on this just a little while. And just think about it. This is what God has done. Enslaved us to a new owner. We're set free from sin's dark, tyrannical grip. And we're able to respond to God's grace by living lives that thoroughly please Him. Sin no longer owns you. Y'all, we don't have a goal of living right to boast our own self-esteem or our own images. That's what the Pharisees did. But, but listen, but we do want to live holy lives because God tells us to and it's what's pleasing to Him. It should be each of our desires. Is this, is this something you ever think about? Hearing God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the small things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Do you think about that much? I think sometimes we get a little out of whack, a little out of kilter because we hear things like, well, you know what, you, 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 and this is true, you can't do anything to make God love you anymore, and you know, you can't not, you know, that whole thing. And, and we sort of get this thing like we're on autopilot, and, and it's somehow wrong to, to want to please God. Well, it would be wrong to want to please God for the wrong reasons, to boast ourselves up. But y'all, listen, we do want to please God. I do want to please God. I want to live a life that, man, when I die and I stand before a holy God, oh, just to hear Him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Just, just you, you, you were obedient in that one little thing. When you welcome people into the church and you handed them a bulletin, and you were faithful in that. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And when you wrote that little note just to encourage somebody and you, you mailed it off and nobody in this world knew that you sent that. You sent that little note. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in the small things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Y'all, that's not legalism. That's obedience to a new master. Well, I feel like I'm running out of time here. Let me just read verse 20 and 21. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, right? You, you didn't have a goal to be righteous, but what fruit were you getting at that time? from the things of which you now are ashamed, for the end of those things is death. What he's saying, before, before God redeemed you, you were living a life. You didn't care about being righteous. You might have wanted to do some good stuff, but it might have just been because you wanted to be moral. And what does he say? What is the fruit of a godless life? What do your lives matter outside of Christ, really? You may accumulate great wealth. That's not going to buy God's forgiveness. You might have all sorts of power and prestige, but that won't buy you even a cup of coffee in heaven. Listen, you might even be super religious and know all about God and know all about the Bible and know all about Jesus, but that's just heaping up for yourself God's eternal judgment if you're still enslaved to sin and unrighteousness. For the end of these things is death. Verse 22, I love verse 22, the first two words, look what it says, but now, but now. You've been set free from sin. You become slaves of God. And what is the fruit? The fruit you get leads to sanctification. That's a big fancy word where we get the word holy from. Living holy lives. And listen, if you have been saved, God is sanctifying you. Do you understand that? The, the very, you, you, listen, you cannot be unsanctified and yet be justified. You say, what does that mean? That means you can't be saved and your life not being conformed day in and day out to Jesus. You can't be. They, they, they happen together. You're saved immediately and your sanctification begins immediately. 
Your, your salvation, your justification is kind of like this. I mean, it's straight up to God. There it is. God did it. But our, that's our justification. But our sanctification is more synergistic. It, it involves us and God, but God's working. But, our, but that, that sanctification kind of goes up and down and up and down, doesn't it? When there's times you just feel so close to God, you're like, I can't wait to pray to God. I can't wait to witness for God. I can't wait to get in God's Word. And there are other times it's just like you're so distant. You're like, can I really be a believer? That's the way our lives can go. Well, Paul will talk about that next week. But just know this, if you're a genuine believer, God is sanctifying you. And if you're doing it with your knees bowed to him, he's sanctifying you and it's bringing all kinds of glory to God. But listen, there's ways, even as Christians, you know, God is going to sanctify us whether we're wanting it or not. He'll do that by chastising us, taking us to the woodshed. Let's to, to the last verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. You see, if you remain in Adam, if you remain in the clutches of sin, one day God is going to give you exactly what you've wanted. You've worked so hard to get eternal death and separation from him. But if you've believed in your heart that form of doctrine that we just talked about, Romans chapter 3, then when it's all said and done, listen, God doesn't pay us what we really deserve. He graces us with eternal life and prosperous life. This message is really about sanctification. I'll close with this. When, uh, when I moved, when we moved, when I was in the Navy, we moved from, I forget where, from Hawaii to San Diego. And I was a member of um, U.S. Naval Forces uh, Third Fleet staff. Like I was on the Admiral staff, this big whoop de doo Admiral, and I got to be on his staff. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, you're like, well, no, that's not really cool. It doesn't matter to me. But anyway, so, so I'd never been on, a, on an admiral staff before. I didn't know what it meant. But when I got to, um, to Third Fleet, and we were stationed in uh, San Diego at the time, Naval Air Station, North Island, and I can remember one day having to do a report. I had to work up a briefing on something that had to do with, can I say it now? Yeah, it's been 30 years. Uh, with North Korea and their submersible, sub, these little man submersible deals. And to, to do that, I needed uh, hands-on a, a chart, a super secret sensitive chart that there was only one of these charts on the entire West Coast, I'm told. This is before computers were just re readily available. One of these charts, super sensitive secret charts. And it was there at Naval Air Station North Island. And it was held by the, whatever, local library. Let's just call it that. So I go strolling into this library, and I'm a, uh, I'm a lieutenant commander at the time, an 04. That's rinky-dink compared to an o, uh, four-star admiral. But I go walking in there, and it's like, uh, I'm doing this report, and I need this, you know, I really want to get this chart, 03-1, whatever, you know. He looks at me, and he's like, <laughs> that ain't going to happen. And he's looking at my little two little bars up there on, you know, on my epaulet. It ain't going to happen. So I go, you know, walk out the door, my tail tucked between my legs and kind of going back my head down. I get back to the, the command ship and I walk in there and I work for an 06 captain, a good guy. And he's like, what's up? Man? I said, I didn't get the chart. He looked at me. He said, do you understand that you are on Admiral Unruh's staff. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you work for the commander of U.S. Third Fleet? Do you not know who you are? Go back there and get the chart. This time, I walked in. Um, I forgot to tell you this, I'm Lieutenant Commander Bradbury, and uh, I'm on Admiral Unruh's staff. And Admiral Unruh told me that I can get the chart. Can I have the chart? Well, just a minute, I'll get it right for you. And you see, I had to learn the lesson. I had to become who I already was. 
And that is this whole sanctifying process that God is, is drilling into our head through chapter 5, 6, and 7. He's saying, listen, here's who you are. You are no longer in Adam. You are in Christ. You are no longer enslaved to disobedience and sin, even though you might feel like it. You are enslaved to obedience and righteousness. You no longer belong to the enemy. You belong to God. So that's who you are. That sign sealed and delivered. You belong to God. You are the apple of his eye. Now just start living and becoming who you already are. That's what sanctification is all about. You've been very patient today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and our Father, we thank you for um, your wonderful grace, even as Lori and Janet sang at the beginning, your grace is still amazing, God. But Lord, we also know that um, you have saved us, you've set us apart, you've filled us with the Holy Spirit, you have enslaved us to righteousness, and yet at the same time, you command us not to give our, our bodies over to sin. You command us to quit doing certain things and to begin doing certain other things. God, may we respond to your commands not as to a malevolent dictator, but to our benevolent king. May our response to you be not what we have to do, but may it be anchored in the joy of what we get to do. And we'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. When we're done, I'll be in this room across the hall. If you need to pray with someone or got any questions or you want to talk about baptism or joining or even if you don't know Christ and you're going, I need to know this Jesus, as soon as we're done singing, I'll receive you right over there. Lord. Let's stand.